So guys, are you ready to go to the moon? <laughs> Here's, here with me, there's uh, Russ Olson from Washington. Russ started his career uh, as a dirty hands engineer, but uh, the wonder of computer programming uh, lured him away. Russ today, this morning, will tell us about the event that changed his life and how it is related uh, to uh, writing soft to today, even if many years have passed. So a big round of applause for Russellson, Thank you. Thank you. who will take us to the moon and back. Thank you. Thank you, Russ, for coming. Right. Thank you very much. You guys all hear me? Oh, I think you can. Um, well, good morning. I am uh, Russ Olson, I work for Cognitech. We are the people behind Clojure and Datomic. So if you're interested in functional programming and Clojure, find me afterwards. But um, Clojure and Datomic and all the things we do at Cognitech and all of the things I think that you do spend most of your time doing and the things that we talk about at conferences like this, they're all about a single question, and that question is how. How do I build a microservice? How do I write this program correctly? How do I fix this legacy application? We are the how people. People, we get paid to answer the question of how. But every now and then, it's worthwhile to stand back and ask a different question, and the different question is why? Why do you do this? You know, you've made it to this conference. That means that you are a very capable person. You could do a million different things, but you have picked this. Why? It's an interesting question to ask every now and then. And so, and, but the problem with the why question isn't just that sometimes the answer is hard to find. Sometimes it's hard to know what an answer even looks like. So I'm going to try and answer the why question, but I'm going to do it in kind of an odd way. I'm going to tell you a story, and it is a story that is really close to my heart, and if nothing else, I think it's a fun story. If nothing else, it'll wake us all up this morning for the rest of the conference. I think it's a fun story, but I think it is a story that speaks directly, at least for me, to the why question. So here's what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do is... Um, tell you the story, and then I'm going to circle back at the end and try to make the case that this story has an answer to the why question. So here goes. Here's my story. It is the summer of 1969, and it is hot. And I mean it is really hot. And when it gets hot like this, sometimes it feels like the world is going a little crazy. It feels like things are just going insane. But here in the summer of 1969, there is an insanity that is all over the world that has nothing to do with the heat. Because here in the summer of 1969, the Cold War is entering its 25th year. For two and a half decades, there, the world has been divided. The world has been divided into them and us. And both sides are armed to the teeth. Both sides have thousands of nuclear weapons. And both sides have been staring at each other for 25 years, waiting for the other side to make the first move, or make the first mistake, or to sneeze. And you better hope nobody sneezes. You better hope nobody sneezes, because they, no matter which side you're on, they have thousands of nuclear weapons. We have thousands of nuclear weapons. And if somebody pushes that button, if somebody pushes that button, we are all dead. If somebody pushes that button, we all have about 15 minutes to live. So here in the summer of 1969, we're hanging on by our fingernails, living life 15 minutes at a time. But for once, there is something else. There's something else in the news that is not the heat and not the Cold War. It's Apollo. It is the project to land a person on the moon. But don't get me wrong, Apollo is all about the Cold War. You see, in the late 1950s and the early 1960s, the Soviets were doing all of these amazing things in space. They, they launched the first Earth satellite. 
They put the first person in orbit. They got the first picture of the far side of the moon. Really, really crap picture, but a picture nevertheless. And the Cold War was like a chess game. They make a move, we have to respond. And so John Kennedy was president of the United States back then, and he had to respond to all of the amazing things that the Soviets were doing in space. And so he came up with a very simple strategy, which was based on the idea that um, of a race and the fact that if um, you're behind in a race, it's better to be behind in a marathon than a very short race. Why? Because if you're behind in a marathon, there's time to catch up. So Kennedy got his advisors together, and they just decided to declare a marathon. Kennedy got his advisors together, and he said, where can we go in space? Where can we go in space that's far away that'll turn this into a marathon so that we can catch up with the Soviets? And his advisor said, well, the moon's pretty far away. And Kennedy said, fine, we're going to the moon. Just a completely arbitrary goal. And we need a deadline. We need a stake in the calendar. 1970 is a nice round number. We're going to the moon by 1970. It was a completely arbitrary goal, completely arbitrary deadline. No one here has ever experienced that, have they? So Kennedy got up in front of the world, and he said that, he was going, that the United States was going to send the person to the moon by 1970. And he didn't make any secret about the fact of what they were doing. He said, we're going to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. We're doing this marathon thing. So how hard is it to get to the moon? Well, when Kennedy said we were going to the moon, people had started going up in the space. That's what started it all. And in fact, a handful of Russians and one American had gotten as high as 300 kilometers in space. And that's pretty good, right? 300 kilometers straight up. It's dark. You can see the Earth. 300 kilometers, but the moon's a little further away than 300 kilometers. Uh, you might think that the moon is 3,000 kilometers away. That's the way it looks in a lot of books, right? You see pictures like this all the time. The moon is not 3,000 kilometers away. How about 30,000 kilometers? No, the moon is in fact 300,000 kilometers away. So you're there, that's the moon. That's a thousand times further than anyone had ever gone into space before. It was just an insane project, just completely crazy. So if you have this insane deadline and this crazy project, how do you even start? What do you, what do, you do? How do you start? Well, I'm not sure what the right thing to do is, but I know what they actually did, which was make the clicker work, <laughs> which was everything, everything all at the same time. They started a whole series of projects, everything they could think of, all at the same time, and the prayer was that it would all come together and work perfectly at the end, because that is always a good plan. So one of the things they decided to do was build a throwaway prototype, right? We're just going to build a spaceship, we're going to take it from the Earth, we're going to land it on the moon, no people, we're not even going to bring it back, it's just completely throwaway prototypes so we can learn what we need to know to go to the moon. And so this was Project Ranger, just take a machine, send it to the moon, and land it on the moon. Throwaway prototype. And it's throwaway in a very NASA space travel sense, too, because to make it even easier, they redefined the word land. They redefined it to mean go screaming it at 4,000 kilometers per hour, pow! And they would take some pictures on the way, you know, throwaway prototype. So Ranger 1 was launched in August of 1961. It's kind of an odd project, right? You're, the goal is to crash the spaceship into the moon, crash the spaceship. So Ranger 1 actually exceeded expectations. Certainly it was ahead of schedule. Ranger 1 crashed into the Atlantic Ocean. Ranger 2 did better. Ranger 2 crashed into the Pacific Ocean. Ranger 3, in all seriousness, did better. Ranger 3 made it all the way out to the orbit of the moon. The moon was not there at the time, and so Ranger 3 went on into the great beyond. Ranger 3 is still out there. 
Ranger 4 died electronically on the way to the moon. It was a brick, and so it was kind of a failure. Let's see. Five. Ranger 5 was apparently worried about Ranger 3 and joined it in the great beyond. <laughs> Ranger 6 actually worked. It hit the moon. It was working when it hit the moon, but they really wanted to get these close-up pictures of the moon. And the cameras failed on Ranger 6 five minutes before it hit the moon. They didn't get any pictures. Ranger 7 actually worked. Took this picture, and then this picture, and then this this picture, and then this picture, and then uh, this picture, blam! It's half of a picture. And you can believe that uh, when Ranger 7 hit the moon, people were drinking champagne and slapping themselves on the back, but you also got to believe that they were thinking, my God, it took us seven tries in two years to do the simplest thing that could possibly work. How are we going to do the rest of this? And the answer is, they just kept doing everything all at the same time. And one of the things they did was they built this. This is the largest rocket ever built. It stands 35 stories tall. It weighs three and a half million kilograms. And it only has one purpose. Its purpose is to throw the very pointy bit, the very bit at the top, at the moon. Because the very pointy bit at the top is the result of yet another project. This is a spaceship designed to keep three people alive on the trip to the moon and back home. Right? So it's got air and heat and shielding and parachutes, everything you need. There's only one problem with this thing, which is that it's too heavy to actually land on the moon. It can go from the Earth to the moon, it can circle around the moon in orbit, and it can come back, but it's too heavy to land on the moon. So to get from orbit around the moon down to the surface of the moon, we have this. This weird-looking thing is a specialized little spaceship that will take two of the three people, so one guy will stay on the mothership and orbit around the moon, and the other two will get in this thing and fly down to the surface of the moon, look around for a little while, and come back. Right? So the plan is to take these two spaceships, out to the moon carrying these people. The guy closest to me, sort of on the inside or on the outside over there, is Buzz Aldrin, and Buzz Aldrin has an advanced degree in space navigation because you don't want your people flying off into the great beyond. So he's a pretty good person to have. The guy on the other side, the far side or the inside here, is Neil Armstrong, and he's actually going to be flying that little crazy little spaceship down to the surface of the moon. Neil Armstrong has one particular talent that I think got him to where he is, which is he refuses to get killed. He's been in three serious accidents and survived all three of them. In fact, Armstrong is one of two people um, to have ever survived a serious accident in space. He's one of two people. The other person is the person sitting next to him. So you can imagine why they picked Neil Armstrong. The third guy, the guy in the middle, is Michael Collins, and he is the person who gets to stay in the mothership. He doesn't actually get to land on the moon, so he's got the worst job in the world, in the solar system, universe, I don't know. His job is the worst job in the universe, not just because he doesn't get the land on the moon, although that's part of it. His job is the worst job because of the what-ifs. What if something happens to the other two on the way down to the moon? What if something happens to them on the moon? What if they can't get back up? In that case, Colin's job is to turn around and leave his friends behind. That has got to be the worst job in the universe. <sighs> It is July 20th, 1969. It's a Sunday. It's about 1600, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. A few days ago, Apollo 11 took off. They've made a pretty quiet trip to the moon. A few hours ago, this weird-looking spaceship separated from the mothership, and Armstrong and Aldrin are on their way down to the moon. They're about to enter the final 10 minutes, the last 10 minutes before they land on the moon. It's a part of the trip that NASA calls powered descent. Back on Earth at Mission Control, 
there are a room full of people getting wet, ready for war. Their job is to watch the data streaming down from that weird-looking spaceship and be the third, fourth, 25th pair of eyes, making sure everything's working, and they take it deadly seriously. Many of these people are in their 20s. They've spent a huge part of their adult lives getting ready for these 10 minutes. The, their door is locked. There's an armed guard on the other side of the door. No one is getting in or getting out until this thing is over. Back on Earth in the United States and in various parts of the world, there is a blanket of tension that you can almost see, you can certainly feel. In the United St States, most people, there's very few cars on the streets because most people are inside, glued to their television. It's right around now, it's right around 1600, that something weird starts to happen with the cars that are on the road. They start to pull off. On city streets, they find a place to park. On highways, they pull off onto the side. On rural roads, they just stop. The drivers can't drive and listen to their radios, listen to what's going on above the moon at the same time. In this very modest house in the city of Philadelphia, on the east coast of the United States, a 10-year-old boy and his dad are watching the coverage on TV. They're both sitting on the couch, but it's right around now, it's right around 1600, that the dad gets up, walks about halfway to the TV, gets down, and puts his hand on his head. And that's the way he'll stay until it's over. They are watching this guy. This is Walter Cronkite on television. He's a TV newsman. In fact, in the United States, he is the king of TV newsmen. And the thing with Walter Cronkite is that nothing gets him excited. If there's a war, you can find Cronkite at the war with explosions and bullets flying, telling you very calmly what it's like to be in a place with explosions and bullets flying. It is 1605, just right at the beginning of that last 10 minutes down to the moon. Armstrong and Aldrin are at 17,000 meters. They've gone through about a quarter of their fuel to get here, and things are not really going well. The problem is that their radio isn't really working. Right? They can talk to the ground for a little while, but then they'll get these huge blasts of static, and it's not just the voice, it's the data as well. And they need that third, fourth, 27th pair of eyes to make sure things are working. So Armstrong and Aldrin, they have their heads down, and they're doing the things you do to make a radio work. They're changing channels, they're adjusting the antenna, everything they can do to make the antenna work. And fortunately, they have time to do that because they are not actually flying the spaceship. There is a cool new technology, something that's relatively new here in the summer of 1969, that is flying that spaceship. It's called the computer. And the, while it's the uh, spacesuits and the rockets that get all the attention, the computer in that little spaceship, is, and particularly the software, is no less of a leap into the just barely possible. And in fact, the woman who designed that software and let me say that again. The woman who designed that software, a woman named Margaret Hamilton, has come up with a new term for the kind of work she's doing. She, she realizes what she's doing. It's life or death, and it has to work. She's doing something different than what's come before, so she comes up with a new term for what she does. She calls herself a software engineer. So, now, in the run-up to... Apollo 11 to the landing on the moon, there was a certain amount of controversy about where the computer should take them to land. On the one side, you have the scientists and the geologists, the people who study the moon, and they were like, yeah, yeah, this is all about the Cold War. We get it. This is about the Cold War, but it's also the scientific opportunity of a lifetime. We have got to land someplace geologically interesting. And on the other side were the engineers and the astronauts, the rocket scientists, and they're like, whatever, what's geologically interesting? And the scientists are like, well, the bottom of a valley would be good, but the bottom of a canyon would be better. No, no, the top of a mountain, but you'd have to get all the way up to the top of... No, no, the rim of a crater, that would be good. 
To which the scientists, and particularly the astronauts, responded, have you lost your mind, right? And so in the end, it was the astronauts who won the argument, and Apollo 11 is aimed at the flattest, dullest, most geologically uninteresting place on the moon that NASA can find. It is 1610, five minutes into that last 10-minute journey down to the moon. Armstrong and Aldrin are at 10,000 meters. They've gone through about half their fuel. And great, good news, the radio is working. The radio problems, they just go away. And you've got to believe that Armstrong and Aldrin are thinking, hey, maybe it's all going to go well from here. And then a display in front of them lights up with the number 1202. 1202 is a message from their computer. Now, I know no one here really understands these old computers, but it's really not hard to translate 1202 into a, something a modern programmer would understand. All you have to do is subtract 702 and get that. <laughs> or if you're a little more old school, you might have that. <laughs> Their computer is having problems. Armstrong gets on the... Uh, radio, and he radios down the mission control, and he says, 1202. What the heck is 1202? There's hundreds of these error codes. There's a moment of frozen horror in mission control, because what the heck is 1202? There's hundreds of these error codes. There's one guy in that room. His name is Steve Bales. He's talking to the experts elsewhere on that computer, and they're telling him that 1202 just means that the computer is getting behind in the things it needs to do, but it should be okay. And Steve Bales has to make the decision. Steve Bales, it's a life or death decision. He's got to make the call, and he doesn't, you know, he's got seconds to make the call, and he just kind of says, just ignore the 1202s, just keep going, just pay no attention. But the astronauts can't quite ignore the 1202s. For one thing, there's a bad user interface design. Every time a 1202 pops up, they have to physically push a button to clear it, because if they don't, it'll just sit there, and if there's another problem, they won't see it. So if they don't clear it, maybe they'll get a 706 or something, which means the engine fell off, and you might want to know that. So they both have their heads down still, pushing buttons, trying to clear these 1202s. It is 1612, seven minutes into that last 10-minute flight down to the moon. Armstrong and Aldrin are down to 20% of their fuel. And good news, the computer starts working. The 1202s just kind of slow down, and then they go away. And finally, 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 Armstrong has a chance to look up and look out the window. He has this little triangular window in front of him, and he looks out the window. Now, they're at 800 meters. If you are flying into New York or London or Rome, at 800 meters, you're getting ready to land. You know, your tray table is in the full upright position. Your seatbelt is fastened. Armstrong looks out that window, and the moon stops being, at that moment, this light up in the sky or this thing he's been trying to do for 10 years. It stops being this thing in theory, and it becomes a place. For the first time in human history, at that moment, the moon is a place. He can look in the distance, and he can see mountains, and the mountains are higher than he is. He can look down, and he can see the ground passing beneath him, and there's rocks, and there's cracks, and there's dirt. The moon is a place. Now, when I was a kid, honestly, I used to imagine I was him. So tr picture it. You're in this bulky spacesuit. You've got this glass helmet on, and you're looking out this tiny little window. How would you feel? You're seeing something no one's ever seen before. I don't really know what Armstrong felt. I don't know what you would feel. I know what I would feel. And the word is terror. The moon is a place. It's the wrong place. Armstrong knew exactly what he should see when he looks out that window. They made maps and photographs. They actually made plaster models. He knows exactly what he should see when he looks out that window, and this is not it. And in fact, he can't see the right place from where he is. And then it gets worse, because on that window, there are these little markings, and he can line his eye up with the markings and look down and see where the computer is taking them to land. And so he does that. He looks down, and he looks down, and he sees this. 
a very geologically interesting crater. <laughs> and the crater's not that big, but the crater is surrounded by a debris field. Remember, a crater is big rock comes out of the sky. Bam! There's stuff all over the place. And the stuff around that crater is a field of boulders, car-sized boulders, automobile-sized boulders. Armstrong looks at that for just a few seconds, and then he makes a very Neil Armstrong decision. He turns off the autopilot, turns off the computer, and then he kills most of their downward descent, so they're only sinking very slowly now, and he guns it forward. He does that because he thinks he can see in the distance, way out beyond the boulders, a decent place to land, some place that's flat and clear. And he has got to get there before they run out of fuel. Back at Mission Control, they can see all this happening. They can see Armstrong turn off the autopilot, and they can see him slow down the descent, and they can see him zooming forward. The one thing they can't see is the boulders. There's not, no live video feed. And the reaction of those people in that room to what, he, what Armstrong just did is extraordinary. What they do is nothing. And in fact, the guy running the show in that room, a guy named Gene Krantz, tells everyone in the room he doesn't want anybody talking to the astronauts anymore. He just wants the radio one bit of information periodically. How much time? How much time do they have left before they run out of fuel? It is 16.14, nine minutes into that last 10 minutes of flight. Armstrong and Aldrin are down to 100 meters. They're down to 5% of their fuel, and they are screaming across that boulder field. They're going so fast that their speedometer is off the scale high. No one ever imagined they'd be going this fast, this low to the ground. But the boulders are going by, and Armstrong now can see there is a clear place out beyond the boulders. He's just got to get there. It is 16.16, 11 minutes into that last 10 minutes of flight. They're down to 10 meters and 3% of their fuel, and Armstrong is now over the boulders, past the boulders, and it's a good place to land, so he's jamming on the brakes to get this thing to stop so he can lower it like a helicopter. It's right around now, it's right around now that he gets the first ominous warning from mission control. It's just two words, 60 seconds. You have one minute of fuel left. Armstrong barely hears him because now he's trying to lower the thing down with a helicopter and he's feeling like a helicopter and he's feeling with his toes trying to find the ground. At a certain point, he can't see the ground because his rocket engine is blowing up all this dust and he can't really see where it is, but he knows the ground is down there somewhere. And it's right around now as he's trying to find the ground that the second warning comes up from Earth. It's just, again, two words, 30 seconds. For God's sake, land this thing. And then Aldrin looks out of the window, and he can see a shadow. It's a shadow of the spaceship on the ground. They are really close. And then he looks back at his instruments, at the instruments in front of him, and he watches a little light light up. It's a light that the astronauts call the contact light. And when it lights up, it means that something hard has touched the landing gear of this weird-looking little spaceship. Contact light means they've landed. Contact light means that these two guys are not going to die, and better, they're not going to fail. Contact light means that Armstrong and Aldrin, that all those people at NASA, that humanity has arrived. It is 16, 17, 41, but Armstrong and Aldrin are not quite done. The plan had been to turn off the rocket engine just a, a half a meter above the ground and let the thing fall the rest of the way. They were too busy not dying to do that. And so they're sitting on the ground, burning the last of their fuel, kicking off rocks, and they have to shut down this complicated machine full of explosives very carefully. So they have a checklist, and they read off the checklist. One of them reads the checklist, the other one does it. The first one checks that he did it correctly. They pair astronaut. And so Armstrong starts. He says, shut down. And then Aldrin says, OK, engine stop, ACA out of detent. And they go through this long checklist of mumbo jumbo, turning the engine off. Back at mission control, well, they can see, like all the data streaming down, they can see 
that the little spaceship has stopped, and they can see their version of the contact light. They can see Armstrong and Aldrin turning everything off. And you would think at a moment like this, somebody would say something profound, something historical. That's not really how people are. So the guy on the ground radios up, words to the effect, we think you landed? Really? Duh. Um, Armstrong doesn't really respond to that because he's just coming to the end of the shutdown checklist. So he says the last item on the checklist, engine arm off. And then he says the words that he had made up, the words that he wanted to be the first words from the moon. He says, Houston, mission controls in Houston, Texas, tranquility base here. They landed in a place on the moon called the Sea of Tranquility. The Eagle, that's the name of the little spaceship, has landed. And with those words, with those words, with those words, the people in Mission Control, those nerdy guys with their ties and their jackets and their pocket protectors, as a group, stand up and start shouting. You can imagine that there's some shouting going on in those cars, right? Remember the cars pulled off, right? What would you do? You'd probably shout and pound on the steering wheel and then look around to see if anybody's watching you. Certainly, there's some shouting going on in that house in Philadelphia. It takes a 10-year-old boy just a few seconds to realize, hey, they did this, they did it. And then he realizes that his dad is no longer down in that crouch with his hand on his head, but his dad is jumping up and down and shouting, and shouting louder than he's ever heard his dad shout before. And then the boy realizes it's not just his dad who's shouting. It's the people next door, and it's the people on the other side. It's the people across the street. It's the people behind them. The whole neighborhood is shouting. And it's the kind of noise that you kind of feel in your stomach more than you hear. And while all the shouting is going on, the boy focuses back on the TV just for a second, and he sees the second extraordinary thing of the day. Because there on television, just for a second, the TV cut away, but it was there. He saw it. He saw it just for a second was Walter Cronkite crying. So that's my story. Um, and you know, every time I tell the story, I've told it to small groups of people, I've told it to large groups of people, very large groups of people sometimes. I always say, oh, this is my story, but that's not really true. It's your story too. You get this story for being one of us. You get this story for being a person who wants to build things. If you roll out of bed every morning and want to build something new, this story is part of your cultural inheritance. And one of the reasons that I want to share it with people is to remind them of the rich cultural inheritance that technical people have. Um, and the best example I can think of of that, best example of how the story is in fact your story is the shutdown checklist. Look at these words, right? Remember the shutdown checklist after they landed on the moon? Look at these words. They're incomprehensible technical jargon, right? These are our words. These are the words that we use in our work, right? When I go back to work next week, I will be saying different things, but things that are equally incomprehensible as these words. When you go back to work next week, you will do the same thing. These are the words of technical people trying to get the job done. These are our words. They're your words and they're my words. You know what else these words are? They're the first words spoken from another world. I like that they're our words. But I did try to make, say that I would try to make the argument that this story is, um, relevant to the why question. And I think the way, one way you can answer how it's relevant to the why question is this. When you do something technically cool, when you do something technically sweet, well, you have the thing, congratulations, but there is the second effect. There's always side effects that come off of it. And the best example I can think of of, this, of a side effect that came off of Apollo is this. We went to the moon because of the Cold War. We went uh, maybe to pick up some rocks and learn something about rockets. And a funny thing happened on the way to the moon. A funny thing happened on the way to the moon. We looked back. We looked over our shoulder. 
and we saw our place in the universe. I know pictures like this, for most people in this room, pictures like this, they're just part of the wallpaper. You've seen them a thousand times. They don't even register, and that's okay. But I would like for you to try to imagine, just for a second, that you had gotten to a certain point in your life having never seen a picture like this. And one day, somebody says, here, look at this. Here's this picture. What would you say? How would, how would it make you feel? I can tell you. You look at it, and you say, holy God, that's everything. That's all of us. That is everything we've ever known. That is everything we've ever loved. That is every birthday. It's every math test. It's every first day of school. It's every graduation. It's every first date. It is every love affair, it's every marriage, it's every funeral, it's every birthday. It's all we've ever known. It is our home. It is tiny. It is beautiful. It is out there in the black. And here's where the side effect comes along. You think about that for a second, and then you think, maybe we should take care of it. There is no greater irony and no better proof of the side effects of doing something technically cool than the fact that Apollo, this Cold War macho, we're going to kick the Russians' asses thing, gave us feelings like that and helped give us modern environmentalism as a mass political movement. You just look at the picture and it comes to you. And that brings me, I think, to the final way that I think that that Sunday afternoon can answer the why question, why do you do this? And it's hard to put in the words, and mostly I think of it as conversation. Maybe you and I go out to lunch. You think we can find some good food in Rome? Maybe you and I go out to lunch, and I have an idea, and it doesn't matter what the idea is. Maybe I want to get rich selling pet food on the internet, or mine the seafloor for minerals, or I have a cure for some disease or something. It doesn't matter what the idea is. But I have an idea, and you're not crazy about the idea. And so we're sitting there at lunch. And so you're trying to talk me out of this idea. And so you say, Russ, no, no one's going to be interested in that. Don't do that. And sure, maybe I'd believe that no one would be interested in my idea. Or you say, um, Russ, it will not make any money. You know, you'll, you'll get poor doing that. And sure, that's a possibility. I might believe that. You could even say, Russ, it's going to be bad for people. It's going to make society more unfair. And sure. I believe that, maybe. The one thing you cannot tell me, cannot tell me, is that it is not possible. See, I'm familiar with the impossible. I saw it done on TV when I was a kid. For me, the ultimate lesson of Apollo is that when you do something technically sweet, when you do something technically beautiful, there is this side effect that goes out from it. It is like a wave. It is a wave of belief. You make people believe. You make people believe in the possibilities. If she can do that, maybe I can do something like that. You make people believe in the future. If he can do that, maybe I can do something. You make people believe in themselves. I can do it. I know this for a fact. I know this for a fact because I am the result of one of those waves. I am a child of Apollo. I sat on that couch and my life changed. It got off of whatever path it had been on and it got on a different path that led me to the university, to engineering, to computer programming, to writing books, and eventually being here with you this morning. So for me, the ultimate lesson of Apollo really has very little to do with space travel or the moon or any of the rest of that, and it has everything to do with inspiring people. Why do we do this? I don't know what your answer is, but I know what my answer is. My answer is I do it because it's worth doing. I do it because, I do it because people are depending on me, my family, my colleagues, but mostly I do it to inspire the people who are coming up through the profession, and I do it for the next bunch of 10-year-olds. So for me, the ultimate lesson of that Sunday afternoon goes all the way back to the words that started it all, all those years ago. We choose to go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. 
go do something hard. Thank you. Thank you.